Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Anyone here have this fear that you spend your whole life making sacrifices and giving up bad habits, trying to keep the commandments and doing the right thing, not following the crowd, not making choices that everyone else seems to be making? As it says in Exodus, you shall not follow a crowd to do evil. Then you die and you get to the other side, and they say, sorry, you are operating from the wrong motive. You didn't have that quite right. And they pull the lever and down you go. <laughs> like, come on. I thought I had it figured out. I thought it was all about keeping the commandments. It's so unfair. Today I want to talk about what we might be missing in our spiritual path, or what we might be missing in our attempts to live spiritually. And work on the things that might be missing in our best attempts to do the right thing. And sort of put away efforts that aren't really contributing to our spiritual life. So the story of the rich young ruler challenges the teaching. The heavenly doctrine have this teaching that says it is not so difficult to live the life that leads to heaven as is believed. We're encouraged by that teaching, right? It's not that hard. It's like, good, I'm glad to hear that. And the Lord says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. It's not so hard. So why is this person who kept all these commandments from his youth missing something? What's he missing? What was lacking? And Jesus said, well, if you want to be perfect, I don't know about you, I don't want to be perfect. I, don't, I think that ship has sailed a long time ago, right? I just want to be good enough to make it, right? So what's required? What is the thing I have to do to inherit eternal life, as the rich young ruler asked? And when Jesus said these things to him, like you got to sell everything and take up your cross and follow me, the disciples said, well, who? They're sort of talking to each other. Well, who could be saved then? This is impossible. The Lord says, with, with, with men, with humans, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So, Heavenly Doctrine says this, the perfecting of a person can never be complete. So, I might want to give that notion up. It's not going to happen. It's not going to be perfect. We can recognize that we're never going to be perfect, though we should try, however, to do the best we can to live by the Lord's commandments, of course. It's not saying that as an excuse, well, you can't be perfect, so, so why bother? That's not what it's saying. It's saying, though, it is a process, and it takes our lifetime. So we need to be patient and be perseverant and recognize that no one else is going to be perfect either. Maybe we have to cut other people slack as well. So I think it's easy to have expectations for other people. They should be doing it right. Anyone here have high expectations of everyone else in your life? Like they should really have it together, right? They should be perfect. They should know. How many of us expect our kids to be perfect? At least partway there, right? Always clean up after themselves cheerfully. Turn off the lights when they're done using that room. Never quarrel, get perfect grades in school. Really care about having a clean room. Not just have a clean room, but really care about it, right? Choose only the most noble of friends and eat all the healthy food that we would like them to eat. And we know that doesn't happen, right? But we can feel frustrated that that's not happening. We can have high expectations. Or you can have high expectations of people decades and decades younger than you, expect that they should have as much experience in life as you have. Like, why aren't they getting it? Why aren't they getting this right? Or even if you have a pet. I know when I had a dog, it's like, I expect my dog to have this figured out. He's not going to figure it out. <laughs> it's a very different thing. But we have these expectations, and even the angels in heaven are not perfect, we're told. They have many changes of state that they go through. Translation is they have many ups and downs in their existence, in their life, and they grow from them. Those experiences help them to become more perfecter, but they're not going to be perfect. So this story really gets down to looking at the question of why. It isn't, isn't just doing the right thing good enough. is isn't just keeping the commandments good enough. Well, think about the story of the prodigal son. 
Great story, the younger son who goes off and wastes his father's inheritance on riotous living. He comes back recognizing the error of his ways. His father accepts him back. And the older brother in the story, he's supposed to be the good one, right? He was, but he was exposed when his younger brother came back. And his father was celebrating and he was angry and he wouldn't go to the party. He says, lo, these many years I have been serving you and I've never transgressed your commandment at any time. Sounds kind of simil similar to the story of the rich young ruler. Here's someone who's kept all these commands, done all the right things. But something was missing. What was in the heart? What was the attitude that was behind all these choices that, they were, being, that were being made? Was his heart in the right place? And it seems like it wasn't. So let's look at these stories as questions for us to look at in relation to ourselves. Like, why are you here? Why are you here in this church? Why do you show up? What are you showing up expecting to have happen? Well, hopefully we're trying to keep the commandments, right? That's an assumption, but even if we're doing that, is there anything that we're missing? Is there something that we're lacking? How good do we actually have to be to be someone who makes it to heaven? How good do you have to be? Well, some Christian faiths will say, well, good actually has nothing to do with it. It really has nothing to do with it. It's all about your faith. You can't do anything to earn your way into heaven, some would say. So let's follow that line of thinking a little bit with your child, for example. Let's say your child says to you, I believe I can do the dishes. That's all I can do. I cannot actually do anything to contribute to the cleaning of the dishes. But I have faith that they will be clean. <laughs> kind of shows how ridiculous that line of thinking is, right? It's not going to change anything. The dishes aren't going to become clean no matter how strongly you believe that they should be clean or will be clean. So let's get clear about a few things first. We will again never be perfect, so we need to give that up. But we can change. We can change for the better. We can stop acting in ways that are against the Lord's commandments and move away from the cravings and desires that feed them. And it is impossible for us to do it from our own strength. Again, with men, with people, with you guys, with me, it's impossible. But as the Lord said, with God, all things are possible. So again, if we can behave well, but not be well spiritually, we can act good, but not be good. We can act loving and not being a loving person. So what's being brought forth here is what's behind it. What more is required? Part of it, no doubt, is we have to fake it till we make it, right? We have to act like a spiritual person. We have to shun things we don't want to shun. Like we might be very drawn to some of these things that we should be not doing. But we force ourselves not to do them. We act like a spiritual person. As the Lord says, if you act that way, the desire will follow in time. So we have to force ourselves, even if we don't want to. And I encourage you not to wait till you want to, because that's going to be a very long time. You're not going to want to, but you can understand that it's the right thing to do, so you can force yourself to do the right thing. And if we do that, the Lord will change how we feel about it. That's his promise. But what we can also do is move from doing the right thing because of what it does for us and doing what, the right thing because of what it does for other people, or because it's the Lord's will, because the Lord asks us to do it. So let's look at the story a little bit more closely. The disciple, or the young, rich young ruler, comes up to the Lord and asks, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? And his first response is interesting. He says, well, why do you call me good? No one is good but God. What is Jesus saying? Well, partly I think he's saying he's not quite done his mission of glorifying himself and becoming one with the Father. So maybe you, let's focus on, I'm not, hasn't completed that work yet. But he is speaking the truth that all good is from God. True. But a pretty common assumption that a lot of us have or question we have is what is the good thing I must do to get to heaven? And we're told that's really not the right question to be asking because it's not a merit system. 
right? It's not like I got to collect all the good works in my pile and when I have enough good works, then I will become an angel of heaven. So it trips us up thinking we have to earn it in that way. The problem with that is it makes us about us, it makes it about what good thing am I doing? And we start to think about how good we are instead of recognizing that any good that we're able to do is actually from the Lord. And hopefully it's flowing into us as inspiration and flowing out of us as an action towards other people because we want to do the Lord's will. So we take that vessel, which is us, and we turn it up to the Lord so it can receive the blessings from the Lord and then use them to serve other people. But again, it's still from the Lord. It's not from us. So spiritual theft, the spiritual meaning of the seventh commandment, thou shalt not steal, is taking credit for doing good to ourselves instead of recognizing any good that we do is actually something from the Lord. The Lord freely gives it to us. It's not ours, and we should freely give it up. And this, too, is a process. But Jesus does answer him when he asks the question. He says, well, if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. And again, he adds a great qualifying question. And I think we think the same thing. Well, which ones? Which of the commandments should we keep? Are there any I can skip? Are there any that are less important than others? Or one that will do the most good? Well, he listed a bunch of them. He didn't list all of them. But then he said, finally, and love your neighbor as yourself. Sort of a catch-all commandment. And it's hard to find a way around that or a loophole in that commandment. And the young man said, well, I've kept all these things from my youth. I don't know about you, but to me, that's really impressive. How many of us could say the same thing? I've kept all of them from my youth. Doubt it. That's a hard thing. And it's it's true. There's two accounts of this story, the one we read today, the one from the Gospel of Mark. But in the Gospel of Mark, after he said, I kept all these things from my youth, Jesus looked at him, it says, and he loved him. He looks at him, and he loved him. I love that. He kept the commandments. The Lord loved that he kept the commandments. And then the young man went a little bit further and asked an astute question. He said, it didn't seem like he would, he would have asked if he thought he had had it all right. But he said, well, what do I still lack? What am I missing? Are we willing to ask that question? What am I still missing? What do I lack? We may not like the answer. It may challenge us deeply if we heard the answer to that question. The answer Jesus gave was, go and sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. Now, it's important to say that he didn't tell him to sell all because he was rich. He didn't say, you're rich, you need to get rid of that stuff because being rich is bad. It makes it clear rich and poor alike enter heaven. The Lord makes that clear to us. But it's not those who are rich, but those who trust in riches is the difference here, who set their hearts on them, who lay up treasure on earth instead of treasure in heaven. As that other reading says, so is he who lays up treasure toward himself is not, and is not rich towards God. So if all of our focus is on, well, we might keep the commandments, but we're accumulating a lot of wealth because we want it for ourselves, and our focus is on that, we're missing the point. Heaven is for all who live a life of faith and love, whether they're rich or poor, the heavenly doctrines say. So we don't know what happened after the, if the rich young ruler gave up. He went away sad, it says. But we don't know if he had a change of heart after that and did some soul searching and he went and did what the Lord says. We don't know. But we can have that reaction as well when we hear hard things. Things that make us sad about our spiritual progress and how far we feel like we have to go. So what is the Lord saying? What is he trying to tell us to do? Here's the point. He says, sell what you have and give to the poor. What he means by that, we're told in the spiritual sense, is detach your heart from wealth. Try not to set your heart on those things, on stuff. Don't take pride in your possessions and the things that you have or think that you're better than somebody else because you earn more money or you live in a nicer neighborhood or you attend church all the time or I'm better because I've traveled to many places or I have an advanced degree. Whatever it is you might fill a blank in with, sell Or give away, get rid of that pride of merit. Let go of the idea that I am better than somebody else or better than you. Open my eyes to those around me. 
That's selling what we have and giving it to the poor, getting rid of that attitude. How do we do that? Well, part of it is the second thing he says is take up the cross. Fight against the lust of and selfish desires that we have. And I want to emphasize that word fight because that's an elusive word in my experience. It feels like, well, okay, I'm going to fight against this evil, but what am I actually doing? I'm just sort of standing there and hoping it won't bowl me over instead of running away from it or forcefully fighting, actively fighting against it. The story of David when he took Bathsheba to himself. What I find most interesting about that story, it says, at the time of year when kings go out to battle, David stayed home. And then that's how he got in trouble. He stayed home, and then he was up on his roof, and he saw Bathsheba bathing, and he took her to himself and committed adultery with her. But do we stay home instead of going out to battle? Do we just sort of sit back instead of actively fighting against what we have to fight against? What does the word shun mean? It means to run away, to flee from the thing that we are tempted by. And like I said, sometimes I feel if I'll just stand here and, and wait for the, the inspiration to fight against it, that's not going to work. I have to actually fight against it actively. I love this passage from True Christianity 5.10. Abstain from the evils of sin and shun them as you would an infernal horde with torches in hand endeavoring to overtake you and throw you upon a burning pile. That sounds pretty, pretty extreme, right? Did anyone ever picture that in your mind as you're fighting a particular evil? Like there's this horde of evil spirits coming after me with torches in hand, attempting to throw me upon a burning pile. If we can get that image in our head, I think it might inspire us a little bit more, right, to fight. The next thing he says, follow me. Follow me. Acknowledge the Lord. That means not acknowledging ourselves. And connected to why the rich young ruler called him a good teacher, Jesus said, why do you call me good? Because there is no good apart from the Lord. If we don't see the Lord as God, we cannot be serious about thinking he's a source of good. Because of ourselves, we don't have the power to resist evils of any kind, we're told. Only the Lord has that power. Do, do we invite the Lord in to fight for us and with us? That's what it means to acknowledge the Lord. In the word it says, in the Lord I live, I move, and I have my being. I love that teaching. It's, in the Lord I live, I move, and I have my being. It sort of tells the story of where my life comes from. So if spiritual living is not a checklist, what good thing do I need to do? Tick off the list. Because it causes us to be detached from our motivation and the heartfelt desire to do the right thing because the Lord is asking us to, because it serves other people. It's an intentional way of being that has an attitude that results in action. We are born not for our own sake, but we are born for the sake of others. So it can seem hard, right? It's harder for a rich man to enter heaven than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. The Lord is saying, if you try to do this by yourself, if you, let, if you won't detach from, from making your riches the most important thing, it's going to be really hard. But with God, all things are possible. So let me just leave you with this imagery. It's a familiar psalm, of course, the 23rd Psalm. And um, listen to the imagery in here of how much the Lord does for us, just in the story itself. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it's highlight phrases of it. But it's a picture of innocence, the innocence willingness to have the Lord lead. Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I feel like I don't need anything else. And it says, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I will fear no evil because he is with me. His rod and staff, they comfort me. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He anoints my head with oil. My cup runs over. Notice all of the things the Lord is doing in that psalm. All the things the Lord is doing for us. Do we know the Lord? Do we know him enough to feel that love for him that is required? If we don't know the Lord, we can't have it. So I do encourage you to continue the path of trying to know the Lord through prayer, through reading, 
come to church, talk about it. Hopefully you'll feel that love burning in your heart and that will be the Lord's presence in you. Sort of like him standing at the door and knocking, saying, here I am, I'm with you. He says, I'm with you till the end of the age. Amen. In this moment, we'll invite you to attend the Lord's Supper. And again, this is an invitation the Lord gives to you to come and receive the bread and the wine, which is his love, his goodness, our, his wisdom, our spiritual food. And if you are struggling with anything particular, it's a great time to bring that forward to the Lord and ask for his help. Or if you've overcome something, to be grateful. Say thank you for how you've helped me.